All right. All right, yeah, you're a naughty girl. All right, here we go. Thank you, Mrs. Clinton. Oh, sh <laughs> Hey you guys, welcome to the first episode of Dark Side of the Mooney. I am Mooney, your host. Um, for those of you guys that don't know me, I live in Southern California. Uh, I enjoy long walks on the beach of some sort. Um, as long as it's not a beach that has sharks or has water. Um, so in other words, by long walks on the beach, I mean I like watching people take long walks on the beach from the safety of my own bed while I'm watching Netflix. Alright, now that we got that out of the way, um, just gonna kind of jump right into stuff, yeah. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the new TV series that came up. Uh, mainly, the what, the first thing I need to... If you haven't watched Scream Queens, do yourself a favor. Get off right now. I'll give you my Hulu account. No, I won't. But start your free trial in Hulu and, do, and just go and watch Scream Queens. Like, I cannot tell you enough that if you enjoy TV... Or if you enjoy the whole like horror satire comedy thing, this Scream Kings, Scream Queens, excuse me, <laughs> damn patriarchy, um, Scream Queens uh, is definitely what the Scream series should have been. Like, you know, rest in peace, Wes Craven, man. I, I'm so sorry that you. I really hope that you did not watch the Scream TV series. Um, I, I really don't know who wrote it um, or. I, obvious, I really don't think he would have given the okay on that. Um, obviously, Wes Craven really had little to no... Nothing to do with it. Because the Scream TV series was so terrible. I know I said I was going to talk about Scream Queens, but I can't really mention it without uh, just saying that. I really think this is what the Scream TV series should have been. I know it's only one episode in, but it's already... In that in the two-hour premiere that Scream Queens had, it had me laughing and already made me enjoy... The in it made me enjoy it more than the entire series of Scream that I forced myself to finally watch. Uh, it, I, I was more impressed by the two hours than the whole eight or ten episodes that Scream was. Um, and I hate being down on something that, uh, you know, a franchise that I really love, but th they should have just stuck to the movies. Anyway, um, yeah, so Scream Queens, for those of you that don't know, it was uh, co-written by Ryan Murphy, who is the guy that worked on things like Glee and American Horror Story. Uh, really great guy when it comes to storytelling. Really, really great guy when it comes to storytelling. And also by having diversity in his show. Um, in Scream Queens, it's about a sorority uh, that is very... that's turned into kind of like what everyone thinks of as a typical sorority. Kind of slutty, kind of uh, manipulative, selfish, um, very, very gentrified, very, very bougie. And that kind of stuff. And then uh, enter Jamie Lee Curtis, which is actually the dean of the school in the series. And she's like a very, very, um, very well put together, strong woman. And she just really doesn't like what the sorority stands for anymore. Emma Roberts plays Chanel, which is the like queen bee of the sorority. And uh, she's she has her best friend slash minions, which are just to go by the same name of Chanel. There's Chanel number two, Chanel number three. There was a Chanel number four, but she went home and had meningitis and died or something. And then there's Chanel number five. So those um, those aren't like the the main main characters. Emma Roberts is one of the main characters, main character. But there is Grace. Um, I believe, which is her name, which is like a legacy, which means that her mom was in the fraternity, or excuse me, the sorority. Um, so therefore, uh, she gets in no, kind of like no matter what. Anyway, the story, uh, I don't want to go more into the story because I want to let you guys watch it for yourselves. Um, 
I mean, Emma Roberts, this, I feel like this was somewhat like the role she was born to play. Uh, she's kind of getting typecast because if you've seen her in Scream 4 or if you saw her in American Horror Story uh, Coven, which was the third season, she's basically the same character um, in a lot of ways. Rich, bougie, very, very self-centered. But in this where it's a satire comedy, it it just works because she, oh man, some of the stuff she says is just so out there that it's just, it, it's fucking hilarious. Excuse my French, I know I cussed, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um... But anyway, um, yeah, so the whole the whole thing, I mean, when it comes to writing, I thought it was great. When I thought it came to production, I, I mean, I really thought it was awesome. I mean, it's everything that you should be based off of, like, a, a, a big network um, satire comedy. Um, the, only, the only one thing, the drawback that I say that I would have on it is just the fact that I kind of wish it was on a, um, like, on the FX channel or on cable rather than, a, like, a network television, just because I feel like they would have been able to push... Um, push some of the jokes and a lot of things a lot further than they already did in there because the jokes I mean the jokes is, are funny by no means is it like a is it like a very PC or political for those that don't know politically correct I mean they're really not trying to be politically correct in the show if anything they're showing stereotypes and um and a whole bunch of things that are just I mean it's honestly pretty hilarious because they're doing it just to show how ignorant it is um, yeah, so I mean, Scream Queens, um, another great thing that I had, uh, a great little like tidbit is the fact that Abigail, uh, what is her name, Breslin, she is hilarious. I mean, I, I love Abigail Breslin, and um, she plays Chanel number no. 5, I believe. And um, she's been in a lot of other bigger movies, uh, like, let's see here, you probably remember her for like Zombieland. Um, she was in Signs, she was a little girl. Little Miss Sunshine, I love that movie. I don't know for any of you guys, but Little Miss Sunshine was amazing to me. Um, so it, I, th with that, and like there's other people in the cast, um, I mean like I said, Jamie Lee Curtis, Emma Roberts, who, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis was like the Scream Queen for a long time. I mean, she's basically, when I think of Scream Queen, I think of Jamie Lee Roberts. Or Jamie Lee Curtis, excuse me. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm fusing them together. Um, but then Emma Roberts, though, however, I would say it's kind of like the modern-day Scream Queen in the sense that, like I said, she was in American Horror Story Coven and she was in Scream 4, both of which roles I feel that she was really unique in. And um, she's definitely typecast, like, don't get me wrong. She, she definitely has a character that a lot of people enjoy and want to see her play over and over. Um, but when it comes to being a Scream Queen, I really think that she's really, right now, um, other than for those people that know Danielle Harris, which she's kind of gotten out of a lot of things, I feel like Emma Roberts is like the mainstream Scream Queen of our of our time. Um, so yeah, Scream, Queen, Scream Queens, I would definitely say I, I give it an 8 out of 10. And the only reason I'm not giving it a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 is because I need to see uh, the whole rest of the season. Uh, the two-hour premiere, I felt, did get a little bit long. I felt like the first hour was a lot, lot stronger than the second hour. Um... However, uh, the jokes were pretty consistent, and I mean, if they can keep that same feel throughout the whole season, then I think it'll be amazing. I mean, I really think it'll be amazing. And Ryan Murphy, I mean, you just... Uh, oh, and then not to... Brad Falchuk and Ann Brennan, I'm just reading this right now, and that kind of stuff. Uh, you guys are all listed as creators, and you guys are just amazing. Uh, so kudos to you guys. Um, I feel like you got another big hit. Um, the only thing I really do hope for is just the fact that uh, excuse me. Um, I do hope that this is one of those like mini series things, kind of like True Detective and American Horror Story, where you're going to be getting the whole story. It's and it's going to wrap up at the end of this season. I do not think that this will be one of those shows that could carry over uh, the same characters and the same story onto second or third seasons. Um, so if they keep it compartmentalized like that, then I think it'll be awesome. This definitely this definitely has the uh the possibility to get just uh, to be one of those tv series that is basically like um how i felt about buffy the vampire slayer um that's kind of how i feel about this it's it's not the exact same don't get me wrong buffy is still going to be unique and amazing um but like for this like nick jonas's character boone oh my god come on like with his little like he's gonna have like a little stuffed frog right and you guys it's just gonna be amazing um I thought Nick Jonas was amazing. Uh, like I say, Ab Abigail Breslin, um, Diego Boneta, Bonita. I'm not sorry. 
if you're ever going to see this, um, but sorry if I mispronounced it. He's been in kind of a couple of things, so it's a really, it's a really, really strong show. If you haven't watched it, I definitely say um, jump into it right now so you can catch the pilot because I really think that uh, this is one of those shows that it's going to be awesome to get in on before it becomes a really explosive popular show. Um, the next show that I'm going to go uh, cover quickly is Heroes Reborn. Um, you know, I like the show. I, and I want, I want to say that first off. I like the show. So please, before I have all these people on my doorstep uh, or whatever saying, okay, you're, you're just being biased, da-da-da, whatever that kind of stuff, um, I, I want to say I liked it. I thought it was solid. I, I think it has a good beginning. That being said, my, my problem with Heroes was always the fact that I felt like they had too many things going on at once. And that was even something that I had an issue with from the other series. I was never a huge big fan of the original Heroes. Um, it's made by Tim Kring. Um, let's see here. Some of the stars are like Jack Coleman, Ryan Guzman. I'm trying to think if there's really no... Other than Jack Coleman, I really don't feel... Oh, excuse me. Uh, Zachary Levi. That's another one that I think would be a kind of a big name that people would recognize. Um, there's really, it's not like a superstar studded cast, but I feel like there's a lot of stars there that are going to bring a lot to the table. That being said, the premiere I felt was just a little bit lackluster, man. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it was. I, I mean, there were some really cool things there, but I felt like there were so many characters that you were trying to get acquainted with that I never really ended up caring about any of them. Like the, um, the uh the uh, the one girl who is in the video game I totally forget what her name is now um Miko Otomo um which is the is played by Kiki Sukazani Suk um I believe like I said I'm terrible with pronouncing names um I thought she was really awesome I'm actually really interested about that storyline um and I'm really you know and I think it's really cool and kind of almost X Men ish um about like the way that they had uh. Well, I'll just give it like a based off. The story takes place originally about a year ago in June where there was a summit where it was supposed to be a peace meeting between humans and these people called Evos. Evos are the people that have human or that are human but have supernatural powers. The heroes or villains, whichever ones. I mean, they have powers, though. Um, in that summit, there was a bombing that pretty much killed a lot of the people there. And then it was it. Then someone that was pro Evo and actually was an Evo supremacist is the one that took credit for that bombing. So therefore, that turned everybody basically in their anti Evo. It made them basically hunted. And it's a really I think it's kind of like a real narration on like the whole race thing that's going on right now, um, in America. So I think, I mean, that's cool that they added that into there, but I just kind of feel like, I, I'm sorry, but I just kind of feel like this was very X-Men-ish. Like, I, I feel like it was almost like exactly like the X-Men story, but they're just applying it to this, which, I, which I'm totally cool with because, yeah, when people are different, you, it's very easy to, to use the trope of, oh, these people are different and we're just using humanity's own prejudice and this is the way it really would be. However, for this show, I feel like it's, oh, okay, like, yeah, this has been done. It's kind of been done before, and it's, you know, you're going to do it again, but how are you going to make it different? And this, they didn't give you enough to really give you the meat uh, and, and the feel of what the show is going to be. So I just, I'm giving it a 7 out of 10 simply because I didn't, I, I don't really know where the show is going, and I don't feel like I can give it a really solid grade until I see, um more about the characters and and maybe more investment see where their story goes see if they're going to flesh out some of the characters more um so yeah um so just for those two quick i feel like the heroes reborn and scream queens uh as two shows that are coming in new i wanted to definitely cover those first because those were just very very um those were the two titles that i was most excited for coming out um so i i just i, I really hope that with heroes I just hope that they don't do what I feel like they kind of did last time, and that was overcrowd themselves with characters. Because that I think that's one of the main things that they could do, and that's what they really need to stay away from. They need to have some characters they need to flesh out and make their characters three-dimensional and instead of just, you know, of uh, just like the simple motivations and that kind of stuff, which I, which I really feel like they did last time. 
Um, the writing, though, uh, the dialogue and everything, I thought was a little bit eh, eh, stilted at times. Um, the production value on this is just amazing. Like, I mean, the fact that some of the CGI that they had to use uh, and locations was just really, really awesome. So I think in terms of production, it's really awesome. This is what I expect from a network television show, though. Um, the production value, I mean, millions of dollars get invested into these things, so they really have to go um, into there. Uh Alrighty, well that being said, I'm going to switch it over a little bit to something that is coming up, and that is the New American Horror Story Hotel. I don't know if any of you guys have seen uh, the previews for it, but yeah, it's going to be coming up, and actually uh, I'll show you this um, in a second right now if I can, so here's the preview. Alrighty, yeah, okay, so now you guys saw the preview. Um, I don't know what you guys thought about it. That, that, that was a Yuso Rammstein, uh, which is a pretty cool metal band. Um, I'm really stoked for Lady Gaga being like in this. Um, one part, one thing I had a qualms about, though, is that I really did not like Freak Show, uh, which was the previous season. Um, the cast of characters, Jessica Lange, awesome, Sarah Paulson, all those people. I mean, really, I'm not saying anything. Dennis O'Hare, man, like they had really, really good people. Oh, one thing, one Thing that I love. Hang on, I'm trying to get his actual name. Uh, Wes Bentley, I thought, was an awesome, amazing, amazing addition. And then Finn Wittrock. Loved him. Loved him in Freak Show. He was kind of... Dandy was one of the only people that really uh, made that show for me. And that kind of stuff. It's me! I need it! I don't care! You're so stupid! Sorry, didn't mean to spit at you, but I, that was my best Dandy impression. Um... He said some of the some of the expressions that he did in that show were just amazing. So and he really went like that. Uh, he really went like that. So I think that's awesome. Of course, Lady Gaga is like the big thing right now. I mean, this is uh, I really this is the first time that she's going to be acting um, with this amount of like dialogue and everything. She was in the second Machete. Machete. Um, however, uh, she I feel like she didn't really get a chance to to shine as the chameleon. In this, when she's going to be the countess of the whole hotel, I feel like she's going to there's there's going to be much more room for her to actually show an eccentric character. Um, plus, I mean, all I have to say is just like um, like Dennis O'Hare is just he's in drag, and that's just awesome. I mean, I think I have a picture of it which I'll show right now. Um, can we add this in post production? Post post. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sorry. I just love saying, can we put this in post-production? Because I think it's hilarious. You can do everything with post-production. Um, uh, yeah, but Dennis O'Hare, uh, just uh, him being in drag, I think, is going to be amazing. He's an amazing actor. He's really been, I feel like, the unsung hero of all the American Horror Story franchise. Uh, I know a lot of people put a lot of, lot of interest into Jessica Lange. But, I mean, if you look at all his characters, they've just always been, like, very... He's been in a lot of pivotal scenes. He's just amazing uh especially in coven i mean american horror story coven was like my favorite it, honestly that might be one of my favorite tv series of all time because i just felt like that was amazing the with everything was just awesome in that and um oh man yeah that was just really cool lily uh, lily rabe too i mean i love her i think she's beautiful uh all all the characters that she's played in american horror story ever since the second season has just been or excuse me, the first season. She was in the first season too, but not that much. Um, and Michelle Pfeiffer is coming. So I'm super stoked for that. Uh, of course, with the return of Kathy Bates um, to Angela Bassett. I mean, both of those people. Uh, Jesus, I mean, Kathy Bates and Angela Bassett ever since coming into Coven were just amazing. I mean, Kathy Bates, holy crap. That that. I mean, you give, I guarantee if Kathy Bates did like a sock puppet show, she would win an Oscar. Because that's how fucking good she is. Kathy Bates, you are awesome. You are awesome. Wouldn't want to get in your bad side. Would not want to get in your bad side, though. Anyway. Um, so that's just a little thing. I honestly think American Horror Story Hotel is going to be awesome. My prediction is that it's going to be... The series is going to probably be uh, about a 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10. Um, they do... They the, the one thing about Freak Show is that I feel like it definitely got over-sexualized on some parts. Um, kind of with the whole, like... Um, with the the double-headed twins uh, getting, like, you know, like, doing their masturbation stuff and that kind of whole thing. There was just a lot of some uncomfortable things in Freak Show that I felt were just not needed. Not that I care, but just the way that they displayed, like, sexuality 
of anyone, not just female or male, but the way they displayed sexuality was just like, you know, like, uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, okay, that's, uh, that happened, um, that happened, I never thought I would see that, but that happened, um, so that's basically how I felt about all of that, um, so that does it for TV, um, I'm gonna go on quickly to, um, some of the, uh, movies that I saw recently, which is going to be Hotel Transylvania 2 and The Visit. I'm going to cover The Visit first just because it's something I wanted to touch on. It's not something I necessarily wanted to uh, talk about a lot. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan, man. M. Night Shyamalan. M. Night Shyamalan. I mean, he's M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Um, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, I like you. I like you. <laughs> I like you, but you're crazy. Um, he... He was really... The story that he gives you is really, really good. And at first you feel like this is going to be like your basic run-of-the-mill horror movie. Or that maybe something supernatural is going to happen, et cetera, et cetera, and that kind of stuff. Um, I thought that was really... Uh, Catherine Hahn is in it. Amazing. It's kind of weird to see her in a semi-serious role. Um, just because she does get emotional in it. And uh, it's pretty crazy just because I always known her as the, like the zany like very very extroverted uh character that she's played in a lot of movies um and in happyish um if you've seen that series um two I believe this is introducing this is uh Olivia de de Jonge and Ed Oxenbold Ed Oxenbold is Tyler which is the the little guy or the um the son of Catherine Hahn and his sister uh, Olivia de Jonge is Becca, which is uh, a girl that's obsessed with film and obsessed with making documentary. Um, just to give you kind of a, uh, just to give you a kind of premises, um, these two kids are going to visit their grandparents' house. Their mom, their mom has had a very, very tenu, a very, 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 very tenuous relationship uh, with her parents ever since she left uh, when she was seventeen or eighteen. She hasn't really spoken to them since, and she's kind of sending her kids there in hopes to kind of, like, make a peace offering, and maybe they, they after they'd want to be in their kids' life and her life, she's going on a cruise with one of her suitors, I guess, which is whatever. Um, a lot of the times you're going to be asking yourself, is this, like, is this a comedy, or is this a horror movie? There are some parts that really make you jump, and that are, the creep factor is just, like, ugh. I, I really, I mean, if you ever want to see, like, a lot of nudity with like old old people then like this is a movie for you and that in itself I feel is just kind of crazy it's just kind of you know kind of a little bit disturbing um <laughs> but um Becca Olivia de Jonge, I feel like I really hate being critical of like kid actors but I feel like the direction that Anna Shyamalan told her to go into was just a little bit a little bit too fierce like she seemed a little bit too obsessive about film and making the documentary in the movie um, that it kind of made her seem like oblivious and just very naive to where Tyler, her uh, her little brother, Ed Oxenbold, who, that's who plays him, is Ed Oxenbold. Um, he, I think, is just what made the movie. He was hilarious. Uh, he's this like little white kid that wants to be a rapper, so he's also like, rapping throughout the whole movie. Um, there, there's a point in which he starts replacing curse words with pop singer names. So, like, he stubs his toe and be like, Oh, Shakira! You know, and that kind of stuff. And, oh, it's just, it's just hilarious. Like, I mean, I'm smiling just thinking about it. That's how great it is. Like, like, the kid was awesome. Um, so I really think that it's one of those movies that if you're gonna, if you're wanting to go see, to see, like, a, a good horror movie, don't see this. Because, honestly, like I said, I still don't know if it's a horror or a comedy, really. Um, there is the M. Night Shyamalan twist. Um, which really isn't, it, it, it's it's a twist that I, I felt like I was trying to guess the twist throughout the whole movie ever since the beginning, and, but even then, um, I couldn't. So I felt like that was actually a good thing because I don't like where I can see it coming, or I also don't like if, if it's so far out there that like no one would see it coming, that it's like, hey, the twist is, this is all a movie, and you're all being punked, you know, and that kind of stuff, or whatever, you know, and then aliens come down and everyone dies. I mean, really, I feel like this is kind of what what I was in for. Um, but the twist is actually very subtle and actually something that it's like, ah, aha, you know, like if I had paid attention more, I probably could have seen it or seen it coming. Kind of like The Sixth Sense, which I miss because I like that and I Shyamalan. I feel like this will bring him back into the conversation of being a good filmmaker. 
Um, however, there was just some parts about this that it's like you when you walk away from it, you don't know if you're walking away from a comedy or you're walking away from a horror movie. There was some definite parts that had me squealing like a little, you know, like a little like a little puppy and that kind of stuff. But there was some definite there, you know, you you leave it kind of just going what oh okay like there's warm and fuzzy, but in this movie it's like you're not supposed to be warm and fuzzy. So anyway, overall, I I totally agree with um. Uh, with the IMDb listing, which is 6.8 out of 10, I think that's exactly it. Um, there's just some times where you don't put that amount of comedy in a horror movie, um, unless it's, like, meant to be satire. But in just the way that he did it, I felt it got very confused. And, like I said, with the acting, uh, with the acting from, uh, Olivia de Jonge, nothing against you, girl, but I think you kind of got, they gave you the wrong direction. Someone gave you the wrong direction... Or it was just really overacting. Um, the next one that I'm going to go just a very, very quick thing is Hotel Transylvania 2. If you guys love horror and that kind of stuff in the sense of you guys like Dracula and Frankenstein and all that kind of stuff, and especially if you guys enjoyed the first one, you need to go see the second one because the second one I feel is honestly better. It's great. It's a great feel-good movie. The graphics in it are amazing. Um... It, 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 and it's also, I feel, kind of... It's cool to see something that addresses... Um, you know, like, like people having parents or, like, kids having parents. But that's not, like, the center of the movie. You know? Like, in other movies, like, the family movie would be ended with her, like, Mavis saying, Oh, I'm pregnant, Dad! And, oh, you know, great. And then the whole thing would be about her pregnancy. And then it would get all Father of the Bride on you and that kind of stuff. Blah, blah, blah. And that kind of whole thing. This, it's like... The kid is, like, in there from the beginning of the movie, and the, really the whole thing is about acceptance. And it becomes really awesome. Like, like I'm sorry, I love I love Pixar and Disney and that kind of stuff, but this kind of put Inside Out to shame. For me. For me. And I liked Inside Out, but I think Pixar has just been getting a lot of, uh... They've been doing really iffy stuff, and, like, they're... I feel like they're kind of just going for the money instead of the feelings and the emotions or putting the work into it. That's just my opinion. I love Disney. I love Pixar. Please don't sue me, Disney, just because I said Disney in my video. Um... Alrighty, so the uh, the next upcoming thing, the what I'm excited for, and I feel like you guys should be excited for, is Green Inferno. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Cannibal Holocaust, but dude, if you have, this is basically going to be the next Cannibal Holocaust. I haven't seen it yet. When I do see it, I'll let you guys know. I think it's going to be amazing. Awesome. Um, to close uh, my first little video here, I think I'm going to f uh, talk about video games and the paywalls behind video games. Um, I recently got Destiny the, t uh, the Taken King. This was the newest deal, well, the newest package DLC content for the game Destiny. Uh, I had held off on purchasing Destiny when it first came out just because I really wasn't a huge fan of those kind of games. Um, I'm not a big first person shooter or uh, FPS is that's how I'll be determining that from it or that's what I'll be calling it is FPS. Um, which stands for first person shooter, redundant, okay. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, talking to myself. Um, I never really liked those games. Like, Borderlands was cool, but it never really, like, I never got attached to it. Like, I'm more of a Skyrim. Um, I just identify more with, like, the medieval kind of, like, magic stuff. Shadow of Mordor, I picked that game up too, loved it. Um, but Destiny seemed cool enough, and enough people were talking about it that I felt like I should become part of the conversation and at least play it. Um, when I started talking to people about what they liked about Destiny when I was first even thinking about it, they said that it was really, really cool, but that a lot of them actually wished that they had waited for the Taken King or the other DLCs and that kind of stuff because they felt when they first got the game that, like, it wasn't finished. Like, there wasn't enough content there to to feel like they should have paid, like, the full, like, sixty nine ninety nine or however much it was, 60 or $70 when it first came out. And I kind of feel like this is a reoccurring thing now for a lot of things. Um, as you know, like, Call of Duty yearly puts out a new uh, a new game. And for the past few ones that I played, I kind of felt like when you first purchase it, it's kind of... It feels like only half a game. You know what I mean? Like, like you play it, and then you unlock the prestige, and then you go into multiplayer, and then you just pretty much, like, grind and grind out 
all these things, get all the attachments to the weapon, then you hit prestige and whatever, and blah, 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 and you drink, like, tons of Red Bull and all that kind of stuff, and then your girlfriend's like, hey, I'm naked, and then you're like, oh, that's cool, but I really gotta get prestige, and then she's like, okay, well, that's cool, I'm leaving you, and you're like, no, wait, I love you, but anyway, that's enough, you know, <laughs> enough about my ex-relationships, no, I'm just kidding, um, the only time I ever broke up over a video game was World of Warcraft, true story, anyway, <laughs> um, so anyway, I just kind of wanted to touch the subject on paywalls. Paywalls, I think, are very, very, very... Uh, they're becoming a little bit more prominent in today's culture, um, especially with video games. Uh, well, I mean, really, that's the way it started was in video games, was, you know, this paywall. Um, it happened a lot in the free to, in the free to play games. It was always like, "Hey, play this!" Oh, but you you used up all your gold coins, so now you have to buy more gold coins to make the game go faster. And did it. And then it, that's eventually where the term "pay to win" became in because in a lot of those free to play games, you really can become extremely powerful, but you have to spend a lot of money to get there. Um, when it comes to console games, I just don't think it's fair that people are going to purchase these games but then feel like they have to wait for the DLC and then pay like an extra 20 up to $30 um, for that DLC. Uh, when, origi when, when you're putting out a game, it should be fun enough. The base game should be fun enough to feel like you're getting a good game and that the base content is enough for you to be immersed in it and have all that kind of stuff. Kind of, uh, I think I asked a question in one of my groups where I was asking about how do people feel about these paywalls and that kind of stuff and they mentioned how they thought that Nintendo and Wii U really did it very good that the DLC content that they put out really has nothing to do with the actual content but it's just added little things like for instance um Hyrule Warriors I actually purchased that game because I am a huge huge Zelda fan um um in Hyrule Warriors they did have a DLC content but the content was just like side, like bonus quests and dungeons and then like a new skin for Link and that kind of stuff, the shadow skin. Um, so other, I mean, when it came to adding stuff, it really was just like side quests and, and you know, all those kind of things. It was really nothing that changed the actual landscape of the game. Um, because the actual landscape of the game, I felt, was really, really awesome. And there was, a, there was tons of weapons, characters, unlockable characters, and all that kind of stuff that you could level up. And the playthrough value was awesome. And I feel like Nintendo really does do that kind of good stuff. Like, even with um, Super Smash Bros. and the whole, um, like, the Amiibos and that kind of stuff. You can still play the game without those. And the game experience is still going to be awesome and just really fun. Those are just things that are you that you used to in either enhance or little side things... Um, to play the game. That's awesome. But however, in Destiny, and I'm just using this as a, uh, as a very, very uh, big example, I feel, because I, I think that a lot of things are kind of ended up like this. Destiny, everyone, uh, like, literally 7 out of 10 people that I had talked to said that they felt Destiny, when it first came out, was not a finished game. That, I think, is just terrible, because now you have these same people purchasing the Taken King stuff, which was still 60 or $70 in that kind of thing because of the fact that they felt that the actual base content wasn't good enough. That, I think, is a problem. Lazy, and I'm not saying, I mean, to make a video game, not only do I think it's art, I think it's also very hard to do. But at the same point in time, we people need to realize that that doesn't mean that you should be a lazy ass and put out something that's not done. You know, like, the fact, like, like what I personally respect about the Fallout games is the fact that they don't put a Fallout game out every freaking year. I mean, I, I just don't, I'm sorry, but I just don't think that even, even for these Call of Duty things and that kind of stuff, they don't require, I mean, you have a Call of Duty that comes out every year, not to mention the fact that it, all, it also comes out with at least three minimum Mac packs and that kind of stuff. So you're having to buy this $60 game, but then you're having to buy these other Mac packs that... And if you don't have those map packs, sometimes you can't get into certain games, or sometimes it's hard because you have those other people that do have them, but then you can't get into the same like lobbies or something that they do. It because it does become it actually does slow it down a little bit because I have played my share of Call of Duty and that kind of stuff, um, and I feel like it do definitely does become unfair, and especially the fact that some of these DLCs have like weapons and that kind of stuff that they can use against you, and those weapons actually are it, when it comes to a multiplayer environment, it it becomes very 
um, it almost does become pay to play. And especially the fact that Call of Duty is trying to get into esports and that kind of stuff. I think that they that they definitely need to make it a way more level playing field rather than just giving these people an option of like purchasing a DLC content and then give and one thing that I hate is that if there's a DLC content that gives you everything that the other people in the base content had to had to play and earn but then boom they just give it to you like they give you that gun that you were looking for that's the same power as this souped up gun that you played and sunk like 20 hours in just to get and like soup up but then oh this thing in the DLC content comes up and it's just as strong and you just get it because you buy it or pre-order it from GameStop or whatever the fuck um, I think that's not cool. I mean, really, it's like people... The rewards for playing the game should still be that. Like, if if you had to grind and grind and grind and get, like, this one piece of gear and that kind of stuff, uh, it, it should be... That should still have, like, status. Like, oh, hey, look at me. Like, I have this. Oh, dang, that guy... You know how hard that is to get? That's awesome. Instead of, like... Oh, I have this. Oh, that's cool. Well, every every other kid that like pre-ordered on GameStop has this shit, and it's the same thing. You know, I mean, it kind of makes. I mean, what's the point of playing? You know, and I and I hate to say that like you want to get things to show off, but yeah, I mean, everyone wants to show off their hard work. So I just think that I, I just really hope that we're not seeing video games go into this go into this kind of thing to where they're putting out games that they specifically know. They just want to attract people to get the DLC content. So that way they end up... Instead of getting like $70 out of them... I feel like they're wanting to get... At least 120 per game per person... Of the of the people that buy them. Like... And that's kind of sad. Because a lot of these people and these kids and that kind of stuff... Video games are important to them. And if you're, and if you're purposely holding back content... Because you want to release it later... And then charge people for it... Then I feel like that's a pretty slimy shit to do you know what i mean and like konami like and this is just like ending thing konami you need to get your head out your ass and you need to start making castlevania games again because this is you're fucking crazy okay i know that was kind of a side note but i feel like uh i feel like just because they're not they didn't go in the same way that the other companies went then they feel like they're no longer relevant which is that that's just not the case um but anyway enough of me ranting i hope you guys had a good time uh, with here Mr. Mooney and that kind of stuff. I know I'm pretty, I could be a pretty charming guy if you can see my, my tortoises in the background. Yes. Yes, they are sleeping. Yes. Sleeping. They, uh, they like doing that. They like sleeping. Okay. Alrighty. Well, me and my, uh, torti, or tortoises, tortoise, uh, are going to be bidding you guys adieu and hope that you guys enjoyed the very first episode of Dark Side of the Moonie. Alrighty, talk to you guys later.